Good afternoon, everybody, and, uh, and a very happy new year to you all. Um, our speaker today is uh, Adam Price, who's the, the leader of Plaid Cymru. Um, he's a very distinguished record indeed. Uh, he was a very prominent member of the House of Commons for almost 10 years. And then he went off and left these shores and went off to, I think, Harvard, was it? Yep. And then came back and became a member of the Welsh Assembly. Um, in these uh, times that we're in, it's, uh, I think, very useful for us to hear from uh, the leader of Plaid Cymru about how he sees Brexit and its effects on the relationship ships within the United Kingdom, uh, and perhaps also uh, on the relationships uh, within the, the two islands, the two offshore islands. So may I ask you just to make sure that your phone is on silent, uh, and the usual rules apply. It's the Chatham House rule. The spe initial speech itself is on the record, and then the discussion afterwards uh, is off the record. And we'll finish at 2 o'clock. Adam, you're very welcome. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, I, I'm, and I'm very uh, grateful indeed for the, uh, the welcome uh, you've uh, given us. There's always, there's always a welcome in the hillsides, uh, as we in Wales say, or, or, or rather more often sing. Um, but for any Celt, uh, Dublin holds out a particularly uh, warm uh, embrace. I'd like to um, give a particular thanks uh, to the Institute for its invitation. Uh, for me to speak, and especially to Andrew Gilmore, who's organising, and has made the, the arrangements uh, so smoothly uh, efficient. Um, my uh, visit comes at a critical and anxious time for our two countries. Uh, we've already had a, a one speech today by a leader of another uh, political party, which uh, uh, will remain nameless, uh, but uh, now there's, here's another one. Um, in the coming weeks, and not for the first time in our respective histories, decisions are going to be made um, by others that will profoundly affect our future um, for years to come. And to, to a great extent, uh, uh, we, and I think you as well, naturally fear for the worse. Um, the reality is that the people who will be making those decisions do not um, necessarily have ha our best interests uppermost in their minds. Their priorities are driven by other considerations, not merely different to ours, uh, but even alien to ours in terms of our way of thinking. But at least in this matter, uh, you in Ireland are surrounded by friends uh, in the European Union, uh, countries and, and people who are supporting your interests uh, in a steadfast way. Uh, the monumental solidarity within the EU has been a truly magnificent thing to behold, uh, not least when contrasting uh, to the vociferous wreck that is the British body uh, politic. When we in Wales look around the European Union, uh, we can certainly find friends, uh, but few who have the structures, the power, uh, or the leverage to give us the support uh, we need. And when we look across our land border to our closest neighbour uh, in this matter of, uh, of Europe, among the political establishment, um, we find only coldness, coldness, in some cases hostility, and uh, more often indifference. Brexit for us in Wales has been a masterclass in our sheer irrelevance. If you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. So we look at, we're looking west for friends, confident of finding them here in Ireland. Now, there's much history we, we can draw on, on here, of course. Uh, this is true not least in the history of my party. Irish and Welsh political nationalism were in many ways in lockstep uh, during the interwar years and long afterwards. Uh, the first summer school uh, of my party in 1926 was addressed by Kevin O'Sheel. Uh, uh, famously, he was the, f the first man uh, ever to have traveled on a free state passport to Geneva in 1923 to negotiate Ireland's entry to the League of Nations. Indeed, every Plaid Cymru summer school in the interwar period was addressed by a Fianna Foyle speaker, uh, often of ministerial uh, uh, rank. They, they obviously left their mark um, um, as my party adopted um, um, Sinn Féin's early abstentionism at the outset uh, and embraced dominion status uh, uh, as our interim constitution policy in deference to Ireland. And like De Valera, uh, we supported a policy of neutrality during World War II, a decision which uh, came at some considerable personal and political cost. 
The tight knot between Welsh and Irish nationalism continued after the war, and a, with a huge rally against partition organised by Plaid Cymru and addressed by De Valera in Cardiff in 1952. A breakaway group of the more cultural Celtic Congress advocating a union between um, the six Celtic nations was formed by my predecessor as Plaid Cymru leader, Gwynfor Evans, together with Donald Breen, son of the Irish revolutionary Dan Breen. Fast forward then to the modern era, and it was noteworthy that when Wales first emerged as a political nation in the modern era, only a short time ago in 1999, uh, when a National Assembly was first elected, the Irish government took notice. Much to our gratification, it, it, it established a consulate uh, in uh, Cardiff. Um, it wasn't called an assembly. That would have been a diplomatic step uh, too far, but to all intents and purposes, that is what it became. The consul general was a senior diplomat, Conor Reardon, who had been uh, seen service throughout the world, in the Far East, in Moscow, in Beijing, and uh, Boston. Now, I don't know how much uh, intelligence uh, of use Connor was able to convey back to Dublin during his um, three short years in Cardiff. Uh, however, I do know he played an enormously important role among our emergent political society during the time he was stationed in our capital. When he arrived, Connor was amazed to discover that the British government wasn't establishing the kind of parliamentary institution being granted to Edinburgh. Instead, we were being given what amounted to a tier of local government, a committee structure with a cabinet bolted awkwardly on top. There was no separation of powers. The legislature was limited to tweaking secondary legislation. And as for the judiciary, it didn't exist, in terms of the Welsh constitution at least. The whole setup was pretty precarious, and the assembly had an in inauspicious start. We won our referendum by a whisker, and in short order, Labour lost two of its leaders. The situation in Scotland was quite different. They won their referendum emphatically uh, and were granted a fully-fledged parliament, complete with tax-bearing powers. Since the union uh, with England in 1707, Scottish identity has had revolved around distinctive Scottish institutions, a separate legal system, its own church, uh, separate education, and more recently a developed financial system and a distinctive range of Scottish-based newspapers. Our situation uh, ha has been quite different. Our identity has depended less on institutions and more on the survival of the Welsh language and the strong feeling people have for their, lo their locality, their bro, the places where they've been born and brought up. The result was that while there was a well-established sense of Scottish citizenship related to institutions, in Wales, our political structures only began to emerge towards the end of the 20th century. You can put it like this. When the Scottish Parliament was created in 1999, it was as though the keystone was being placed in an arch of an already existing structure. But when the National Assembly was created in 1999, its role was to build uh, that arch. Conor O'Reardon quickly uh, grasped all this. He also realized that political institutions mean much more than the rather mechanical structures of parliamentary uh, structure, uh, institutions. A political culture relies on the networks of soft relationships in civil society that oil the wheels, the NGOs, the think tanks like this, uh, lobbyists, the press and media. We had to build those as well, and we had to create the milieu in which they could circulate and do their work. In all of this, Connor was a central figure. He brought people together, often people who, despite the small size of Wales, and despite their sharing many interests in common, had hardly met. Connor's uh, and Ireland's regular soirees became famous, and not just because of the wine that flowed, or rather maybe the Guinness and the generous canapes. Invitations were much sought after because it quickly became known that it was here uh, in the Irish consulate you could catch the year of the first minister, his other ministers, leading figures across the parties and wider civil society as well. And when the history of this um, period for Wales comes to be written, Conor O'Reardon and uh, the Irish consulate should warrant more than a footnote. Looking back at the last 20 years uh, and all that we've achieved constitutionally in Wales, the separation of powers, the creation at long last of a lawmaking parliament, 
the coming of taxation powers, the steps we are now undertaking towards a separate legal jurisdiction, none of this would have been possible without the emergence of a cross-party solidarity on these questions. That would not have happened in turn without the creation of our distinctive Welsh civil society. And that would not have happened without the contribution of people like Conor O'Riordan. Now, I concentrate on this small piece uh, of history because it's an example of what important, uh, though often unseen, consequences can result from close relationships developing between uh, neighbours. We were much encouraged, therefore, by last week's announcement that the Irish consulate is to be reopened in Cardiff uh, in June, following its closure a decade ago as a result of the financial crash. Now, it should now be, in, uh, in our view, a Welsh Government prior priority to open our own uh, consulate um, one day, uh, hopefully soon, an embassy here in Dublin. It should be much more than the, the, the current arrangement, which is uh, a few desks uh, uh, tucked away in the British Embassy, all, albeit uh, assiduously occupied by an excellent uh, uh, representative. Uh, but it'll certainly be a priority for an incoming Plaid Cymru government in 2021 to create a, a fully-fledged Wales House here in Dublin. Because we have a good deal to learn from each other um, and a good deal to benefit from greater cooperation, especially during these dark days when we're pu being pulled asunder by Brexit. There are many lessons for us in Wales from the remarkable advances you've achieved over the past decades uh, here in Ireland, many of them economic to be sure, but others cultural in their impact. For our part, I believe Wales can be much more than just a land bridge for Ireland to England um, and continental Europe. We hold out the prospect of being a political partner in a great project in the 21st century, a project made more, even more urgent by the Brexit debate, a project that is nothing less than a fundamental restructuring of political relationships across this Western European archipelago. These are big claims. Well, let me start with the economic vision you, you, you've given us. Um, in 2017, the Irish Republic grew its economy by 7.2% compared with 3% uh, in the UK and just 2.7% uh, in Wales. It's, it's worth remembering that um, in 1960, uh, by some, measure, uh, some measures, people in Wales were about 60% richer uh, than citizens of the Irish Re Republic. By the mid-1990s, having taken full advantage of Ireland's independent membership of the EU uh, for over two decades, you overtook us. Now, now the situation is completely reversed. It, it's you who are 60% uh, richer in per capita terms uh, than us. Your, your growth rates since the 1990s have been truly staggering, uh, notwithstanding the 2008 crash. Uh, the Irish economy has not only kept pace with other strong economies across U Europe, such as Germany and France, but it's outpaced them. Uh, and only countries like uh, China, South Korea and India have had such an impressive record of uh, growth over this period. The question is why? One of your economists, David McWilliams, provides at least some of the answers in his recent book, uh, Renaissance uh, Nation. As he says, your economy took off uh, precisely um, at the moment when Irish society opened up to new ideas, became more tolerant, and provided dignity to people whose lifestyles were pr previously shunned. It seems to me no coincidence that the beginning of your economic miracle can be traced uh, to 1990. That was the year that Ireland voted uh, for Mary R uh, Robinson, uh, a, c a civil rights uh, lawyer, a liberal campaigner, and uh, most importantly for this argument, a woman uh, as, as president. Another important moment, uh, of course, uh, and I speak as, as the first um, out uh, gay man to lead a, a political party in the UK, was the election of uh, Leo Varadkar as TD for Tub uh, Dublin West in 2007, and then as Taoiseach uh, a decade uh, later. And it all came to head, of course, uh, finally with last year's repeal referendum, symbolising the extraordinary changes that have swept through uh, Irish society. McWilliams describes all this as a culture war uh, about the primacy of individuals to make their own choices contain, uh, concerning their lives. As he says, there's a direct connection between the workings of the economy and such societal factors as the availability of divorce, abortion and contraception, private morality, women being educated, the LGBTQ community being afforded dignity, and belief in science over superstition. In the Western world, enlightenment values and a successful economy go hand in hand. Now, we have our own uh, culture war in Wales, but m uh, more of a political uh, than a relig religious one, possibly. It revolves around the struggle to remove the debilitating pressure that has been uh, uh, pressing, uh, weighing down uh, on us for nearly 100 years, the weight of a single party 
uh, state. I mean, the Labour Party has been a dominant force now uh, uh, in Welsh politics since 1918. Uh, Labourism uh, uh, has sucked the oxygen out of our attempts to renew life in Wales. It's not democratic socialism or even social dem democracy that has been ruling our lives, uh, 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 that rather it has been a cloak of, of warm mediocrity that has been extinguishing any spark of individuality and creativity. In some ways, the Welsh Labour state is the worst of all possible worlds, a sort of weak managerialism uh, that blends old-fashioned command and control uh, with incompetence. To use the colourful phrase of P.S. O'Hegarty, it is a collection of mediocrities in the grip uh, of a machine. Worse than that, Labourism is a backward-looking identity, one that relies on a, on a dependency culture living on handouts. It rejects notions of self-reliance and being responsible for own, uh, our own affairs. It's content to leave Wales in a state of infa infantile underdevelopment. It doesn't believe in our having a mature national identity. In fact, it rejects most emphatically the very idea. Little wonder, therefore, that we started the new year with Wales still at the bottom of the UK's national and regional economic league table, with income per head uh, um, of 72.5% uh, of the UK average, one of the worst figures ever uh, recorded. We only created the be beginnings of self-government when we established the National Assembly, as I said, in 1999. For the last 20 years, we've been led by successive Labour administrations, afflicted essentially with a begging bowl mentality wrapped up in what appears to be a pragmatic uh, common sense. Well, Brexit is putting the skids under this uh, underachieving, complacent and, and ambitious approach uh, to government in Wales. Whether Brexit goes ahead or not, uh, and there is hope uh, that uh, the progressive forces of which we are a part in Westminster can still stop it, the ruptures it is causing are proving a powerful force for change. Brexit has wrought visceral divisions in both the Conservative and Labour parties, both are preoccupied with maintaining uh, their unity. Neither are fit for government, but their disarray is an opportunity and not just for us as a political party in Wales. For if we can seize the moment with imaginative solutions, it will be an opportunity to recast Britain itself. What Brexit has shown with devastating clarity is that the British political system is broken, deadlocked, incapable of reaching a consensus. In these circumstances, there is a chance that the Brexit decision will be driven unwillingly, to be sure, back to the people for a further referendum for a people's vote. Um, this is something that uh, we in, in Ply Cymru uh, would absolutely uh, welcome. Indeed, we've been campaigning for it. Uh, and, uh, but if it comes, that vote cannot just be a, a rerun, obviously, what went uh, through in 2016. Uh, today, we're faced with a new proposition. We now have a better understanding about what it means to leave the EU. The choice we will, uh, we will face is the flawed uh, actual deal that has been obtained by Mrs May or remaining in the EU. Uh, but as I say, this, this time remain cannot just mean staying with the status quo. Um, um, remain is not a particularly attractive um, slogan when you're living in poverty. Um, so re it, it must be a question of re remain and reform remain and renew, remain and regenerate. We have to actually um, uh, uh, um, present to people a different, an alternative and better change project um, because that's why many of them voted uh, Brexit, um, those that were uh, deeply uh, disenchanted with the, the existing uh, status quo. Um, so it must be a vote for a, for a different Europe, uh, a different Wales and, a, and, a, and indeed a different Britain. Within the United Kingdom, reform must mean a, a new state where economic wealth is distributed more equally. Uh, this will benefit much of Northern England as much as Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, uh, or Scotland. A host of st statistics reveal how much wealth, investment, and research and development are concentrated in just one tiny corner of Britain, in London, the, the English Southeast. It's the explanation why this is the only part of Britain that produces uh, currently an economic surplus. The rest of the UK is in deficit, um, and persistently so. So this syst systemic imbalance is the source of much of the uh, social injustice in the UK, and, and indeed, as I've said, uh, the, uh, it propelled the Leave vote in the 2016 referendum. Uh, and it's the result of, of uh, political choices over successive generations by 
political administrations in Westminster of both uh, main political parties. And it's in stark contrast, really, with the, uh, the core princ European principles of cohesion and solidarity. Um, it was telling that in the 2016 referendum, the progressive Remain forces of the left campaigned as Scotland stronger in Europe and Wales stronger in Europe. However, in England, they campaigned as Britain stronger in Europe. Um, for the progressive forces of the, of the, of the British left uh, in England, um, uh, their own country was not worth uh, mentioning. That has to change, and, and we in Wales, with our friends in Scotland and Ireland, um, can be part of making uh, the change. The left cannot afford any longer to allow the right, increasing the far right, to have a monopoly on English pride and patriotism. And by our own example, we can show the way to a progressive remaking of Britain, and that will entail a reinvention of a progressive sense of English nationhood as well. And, and where will that spring from? Well, simply from this, from an understanding that sovereignty is not a, a, a zero-sum game. It is, in fact, the opposite. The whole European project has been about sharing sovereignty, and through the lived experience of that sharing, we've seen that it actually enhances, increases, and grows your sovereignty, and the Republic of Ireland and your success uh, over the last few decades actually is the shining example of that. So it will be within these islands. It will be composed of four nations, different to be sure, just as family members are different, uh, different in size certainly, but treated equally and enhancing their shared sovereignty through a partnership of equals. And in turn, this experience will allow the English uh, to be truly themselves. They will be free at last from the shackles of a British state that clings to an outmoded uh, notion of an imperial past, a state with an inflated, hopelessly unrealistic um, sense of its place in the world, a vision of its place in the world. And this is the alternative vision that I hold out to you. You may say that it's hopelessly um, uh, optimistic, that the English can never come uh, to see themselves as simply English and European rather than global British, to use the, the neo-imperial jargon de jour. Um, that they commend, condemn to a kind of a solips, uh, solipsistic existence of seeing themselves as endlessly exceptional. Um, I say that it's, it's our challenge, and by our challenge I mean that of ourselves, together with the Irish and Scots, to persuade our English friends that they have a better future, forging a new collaboration on these, on these islands, a collaboration based on an equality of partnership and respect. And I suggest that it will be a collaboration that builds on structures that we've already created as part of the Good Friday Agreement that produced peace in the North of Ireland, the British Irish Council. This should be a meeting place where we can begin to forge the common understanding that we will, make, we will need to take our new relationships uh, forward. Our different nations are all at different stages in, in their development. In the Republic, you have an economy and society uh, anxiously preparing for whatever outcome emerges from Brexit and particularly for the consequences in, in the north of Ireland. In Scotland, they are awaiting the, the outcome of Brexit to determine the timing of another referendum on independence. England is in a process um, of becoming England. In Wales, as ever, we're awaiting the decisions of others, but meanwhile we are making plans for a greater say in our own fate. Our aim uh, in Plaid Cymru is for a referendum by 2030 at the latest, uh, but earlier if there is a material constitutional change, such as Irish unity or Scottish independence, on our own independence uh, as a nation. I put it to you that all of our dilemmas and choices can be illuminated, made clearer, and therefore easier if we work together in whatever forums we can agree to meet. Within the UK, it will be within the Joint Ministerial Council, which br brings together the cabinets uh, of the UK government and the devolved administrations. That needs to be reformed and made fit for purpose. Within, uh, within uh, these wider islands, the obvious forum is the British Irish Council. And in these settings, it's not hard to see what an emerging agenda might look like, Brexit or no Brexit, an overriding need for a fairer distribution of investment and economic growth across the UK as a whole, and a need for a recalibration of our political institutions to, to ensure this will happen. And that means a confederal relationship between the nations of the UK evolving on, along the lines of the Nordic Council of Sovereign States that governs the relationships between the Scandinavian nations. If Brexit takes place, there is likely to be an acceleration of moves uh, in these directions. Uh, the centre cannot hold, and who knows, there could be uh, scope as well for much greater cooperation between the Celtic nations, even the formation of some kind of Celtic union, to echo 
uh, Gwyn Vorhevan's vision from some time ago. The most immediate institutional form for this would be, as I've already indicated, strand three of the Good Friday Agreement, which established the British Irish Council. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, strand three refers to the participants um, among, obviously, uh, the Irish government, the Welsh government, the Scottish government, the Manx government. Uh, it suggests that they could establish their own organisation within its structure, um, uh, and I quote, in addition to the structures provided for under this agreement, it will be open to two or more members to develop bilateral or multilateral arrangements between them. Such arrangements could include, um, um, could include subject to the agreement of the members concerned, mechanisms to enable constitution, uh, consultation, cooperation and joint decision making on matters of, uh, uh, of mutual interest. So the, the, the platform is already there for deepening cooperation between uh, the Celtic nations in these islands. And such, such a, a collaboration could obviously include the Northern Irish uh, government when it's re-established. It could establish uh, a Celtic development uh, bank uh, for joint infrastructure investment projects in energy, transport, and commu communications, whether that's um, helping us with our Tidal Lagoon project that was cancelled by, by Westminster, or even this uh, fascinating proposal the Scottish government are looking at in terms of a Celtic sea bridge uh, between Scotland and, and Ireland. I've traced a large... Uh, ambitious uh, can canvas, uh, I suppose, culturally and civilizationally, we, we've always been nations of dreamers. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, um, but whether we like it or not, um, uh, and I'm sure many in England will not l l like it, we have to recast the future. Um, we have no alternative. Uh, in um, her game of high uh, stakes political poker with her Brexit strategy, Mrs May is pursuing... Um, a dangerous and, and deeply irresponsible course. Uh, she's pushing events ever closer towards the 29th of March deadline in an attempt to force people to accept her deal or confront the prospect of crashing out with no deal. I, I don't think her strategy will work. Um, it cannot be allowed to work, quite frankly, and we need to make common cause there. But whichever way the current chaos at Westminster plays out, there will be opportunities for our Celtic countries to work together for mutual benefit. And I've suggested here today some avenues we might explore. In Plaid Cymru, we are anticipating these developments with enthusiasm, for we're confident we will win the forthcoming arguments, not just because the facts are on our, si are on our side, but because we believe we have the better dream. Our vision um, is for a new society, a new politics, yes, a new Wales, but, but also uh, a New England, a New Scotland. Um, I hesitate to say, suggest the New Ireland as well, but certainly a New Europe uh, too. Let's, let's seize that common opportunity. Thank you.